This is an oral history interview with Dante Anzalini. It's March 28, 2005, in the Lewis Music Library. I'm Forrest Larson. It is my pleasure to welcome Dante Anzalini, Professor of Music and Conductor of the MIT Symphony Orchestra and the MIT Chamber Orchestra. We are in the Lewis Music Library and the date is March 28, 2005. Thank you so much for, for coming. It's just a real pleasure to have you. You have been at MIT since September 1998 and will possibly be leaving this spring or during the next academic year. Um, so starting off with just some, some biographical things, can you tell me what year you were born? Yeah, 1959. 1959. December 7. Wow, so, so you're a year older, or a year younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were born in Barriso, Argentina. Did you grow up there as well? Was yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell me what sort of place that is? Is it a city or a, a town? It's a small town that is nicknamed um, the capital of the immigrant. So you got, you got, for instance, you go to different neighbors. I was born in the neighbor called Roma. Uh -huh. Obviously in, yeah. the, in the Italian one, but the funny thing is like two blocks from the place where I first lived, there was a Czech Republic club <laughs> and Arab quarter, uh, Wow. Uh, and uh, for instance, I remember the Lithuanian uh, part was kind of like three or four blocks away. And it's such a big melting pot that you cannot explain. Um, you, you got, you know, you go, you walk, I mean, even nowadays, the, the street and you see all these uh, blonde features from the Northern Europe, uh -huh. you know, combined with all the Mediterranean features of the most of the Italians and and uh, Spanish uh, uh, people that uh, more or less, I mean, they are actually probably 70, 80% of the population in that small town. Mm -hmm. Now the town it has to be 55,000 people. Uh -huh. And they were, uh, they were not ghettos in the, in the sense of yeah. uh, places in, in which, you know, there, there was no freedom. No, I mean, the contrary. But there they were places in which you would hear m much more Italian or Arab or some variation of Czech or some variation of whatever, Lithuanian, any language but the, uh, the actual Spanish. Wow. So that, that's where, it's a little town, beautiful. So how far is it from Buenos Aires? I couldn't tell from the map that I looked at. Uh, it's uh, 57 kilometers to La Plata, and it should be 65 to Berisso. Uh, La Plata is the, the, the following, s the city nearby, which is the capital of the whole province. Right. Uh, Berisso is a small city that, uh, by the time that I was born, it was a very important one, but because of some, uh, the meat industry there was important, there was a port. Okay. Yeah, so that's where that's why you know all people from Europe were coming you know to that mm -hmm. that port. So one of your parents was Italian and the other Chilean. Um, can you tell me um, about them and, and and all that? Yeah, they, they, they uh, my my father uh, literally escaped from Italy after the Second World War. What was his name? Uh, Lorenzo Dante. Uh -huh. Lorenzo first name Dante and that's why my first name came about I see. Uh, because of his second name yes it was a big fight in my family anyway uh, the, uh, yeah 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 my my mom uh, also his I'm sorry her mother my grandmom also escaped from Chile the very south the most southernmost uh, city it's called Punta Arenas. Uh, it's literally in English, Sand Point. Uh -huh. That's near Antarctica. So my grandmother was a, um, 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 uh, a, she got pregnant when she was a teenager. And uh, in that 
highly charged prejudice little town of the south of South America that was a mortal sin so she lived there for a couple of years but finally she escaped uh, from that place and went north without any profession my 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 I think that she was 19 when she left uh, Chile and my mom was already four so they went to live in that tiny city because there was a lot of a lot of going on I mean that tiny city near Buenos Aires it wasn't a big city mm -hmm. it was plenty of immigrants and my father some 15 years after that which is actually when my father was 21 he left uh, Italy uh, because of the fact my father had nine brothers and most of them had left uh, for Australia one of them wanted to come to the States and finally went down south to Argentina and so there were two guys uh, living in Argentina and he went there as a tourist he never thought of staying there oh, he actually wow. never wanted to stay there and uh, they met in a ballroom uh, and they always talked about the simple fact that uh, my father was inviting her to dance and my mom uh, thought that this guy was Spanish uh -huh. such a good Spanish he had in yeah. the few years that he stayed he had a good year and uh, that's why by chance I'm first generation Argentinian Wow so what was your your parents professions my, my, my father uh, studied uh, in a professional school uh, he didn't do the high school secondary mm -hmm. school he was a carpenter by profession mm -hmm. and my mom housewife yeah uh, the relation with music was very is very strange I can tell you that because none of them were musicians Oh, interesting. But in spite of that, there was a lot of music going on in the house. My grandfather was actually the official organist of a couple of important churches in Friuli, in Ven uh, near Venice. Uh, and he um, forced all his children to study music, with one exception. The only one who didn't want to uh -huh. was my dad. Wow. So everyone in the family knew how to play one instrument. I mean, the nine kids. And my father always refused to receive any lessons because he was fearful of my grandfather's manners. Because every time that someone misses no, miss the <laughs> note, oh. he was banging <laughs> on them. <laughs> Therefore, my father probably was the one that loved music the most, but he never actually play an instrument uh -huh. did he sing and stuff like that no? no my father my grandfather was organist and obviously in those times choir master in both uh, churches at the sides of the river the main river in in in, in Friuli it's called tagliamento w which means cutting uh -huh. you know the, the cutter right. rather, yeah something like that so we divide the the two regions, the, the one Venezia and the other Venezia uh, Friuli, Venezia Giulia. So the two regions near Venice. Uh, so, uh, what was your grandfather's name? Luigi. Luigi. Yeah. For, for many generations, they, that's uh, another one, uh, they were always named Luigi, the first ones in the, all these num numerous families with a lot of children. The first sons were named in my family, always Anzolini, Luigi or Giacomo. Uh -huh. Gia Giacomo is actually my second name, but translated into Spanish because I was the first one. So it's a, my grandfather was Luigi, my grand grandfather was Giacomo and so on for I think seven or eight generations. Wow. Um, what about um, siblings that you had? How many siblings? So one, one sister. Uh -huh. my, my sister Olga. She's uh, younger. 
she used to be a musician she played uh, viola guitar recorder and piano uh -huh. is she still in Argentina yes yeah, she is in Argentina she's an actress Actress. Wow. She, uh, by profession, she's, she's an actress and she's a, a very important figure in the in a leftish political party. Tell me more about some of her her professional activities. Uh, um, does she do like theater or television? She, no, or? she does theater. She does yeah. independent theater, kind of uh, they call it in New York underground, some sort of mm -hmm. like that. Although last year she won the first. Uh, the national prize for her directorship because she turned director now in the last four or five years so she's directing plays mm -hmm. rather than acting now now lately you know she's mm -hmm. uh, she must be 40 now 40 yeah she's 40. has she written any any plays uh, no 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 but she only worked as, a, as an actress she, she taught uh, acting for a number of years in, in several places. Before that, when she was a teenager, she was a musician, and mm -hmm. she started. She played the viola. Yeah. Did you ever play with her and do professional no. work with her? No. No, I I taught her. I I, I she w she she was uh, one w one of the first uh, people that I taught uh, ear training. Mm -hmm. My way of studying uh, a, a perfect pitch. Uh, but b besides that, I, I was uh, our age difference is five years, mm -hmm. and by the time that I was a teenager, I was already professional myself. Yeah. So she, when she entered in music, I was already kind of like far from yeah. the level she that she was achieving. Right. By the time that she was achieving a nice level, she decided to go on with the acting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, you speak a number of languages, uh, you know, besides your native Spanish and Italian from your family, mm -hmm. um, and I take it you also speak s Portuguese. Mm -hmm. is, uh, do most Argentines um, speak Portuguese because it's so close to Brazil? Is that, is no. that common? No. no, no, at all. No, no, almost no one. It, it's, it's funny, but it's even on the contrary. Usually, Argentinian-born people go to Brazil and they cannot understand a single word of Portuguese. In spite of the similarity, the incredible similarity, mm -hmm. is, uh, they, they are like uh, two dialects. The sounds that you have to produce with Portuguese, the different phonemas, uh -huh. the different, you know, are right. so complicated that they cannot understand. In a, but but on the other way around, the Brazilian, Brazilians do understand usually Spanish uh -huh. from Argentina. Much easier than Argentinians otherwise. Uh -huh. yeah, they, they wow. yeah. So when did you start learning English? Yeah. English, uh, we had in uh, high school, we had some, mm -hmm. you know, two hours per week. It didn't amount, amount to too much, honestly. Then I, I studied some, when I was in the university, I uh, there was, I, I <laughs> did an exam in mathematics. In, uh, uh, English was uh, studied as second language because we were supposed to study algebra and, and analysis uh, through some English texts. But I didn't know much, much, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, th then I, I studied with a private teacher before I came to the States two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I decided to come to take an examination to start studying here. But my English was very rudimentary when I first came here mm -hmm. as a student, very, extremely. I basically learned how to speak uh, English in a black church in New Haven, uh -huh. uh, and also reading every single minute that I went out of class in, at Yale, knowing that my level was uh, not enough, I read every single minute, everything that I knew in other languages in English. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so I could compare grammars and things. Right. And, and then I, I, you know, I tried to perfect it as much as I, I possibly could with papers and all those things. But that was my English. Uh -huh. thing, yeah. Are there some other languages that you read or speak? Yeah, yeah German. Uh -huh. German, G German. I, I, I studied somehow at Yale in my second master's. 
but I really learned when I went to work in Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, for I was a uh, I, I was a uh, solo repetitor, uh, dirigent, uh, conductor in Bonn, and then I went to also to work in another uh, the, the, s- the Swiss Deutsch, uh, I know Swiss Deutsche Schweiz, they uh-huh. say, yeah? the, the Swiss uh, Switzerland uh, kind of variation of Deutsch, but German, but but I I spoke usually Hochdeutsch. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I learned there, and uh, I I I can read easily French, and I understand French most. Of, but I don't I don't uh, speak it very fluently yet. Mm-hmm. I, it's one thing that I have to improve, and I and I have a good working knowledge of uh, Lithuania. I I went to work in to Lithuania, and uh, I learned basic things. And I surprisingly enough, I you know. In the last months, I, I was able to understand a good 50 or 60 percent of their conversations. Although it's completely different roots, you know, right. it doesn't have anything to do with Romance languages, uh, nor with with German for for the case. You know, I did you first get exposed to that um, back in in Barista? You said there was a Lithuanian. No, uh, honestly, no. I I knew of it, but yeah. but uh, I didn't have any fr- any Lithuanian friend. Mm-hmm. And usually, I was exposed to the Italian community. My father, with one of my un- uh, uncles, founded the Italian club in Berisso. So mm-hmm. we had these big meetings in which the only spoken language was uh, Italian, aside from my mom. My mom didn't know how to speak, and she was always discriminated mm-hmm. in uh, some bad sense, too. Mm. I, I experienced racism when I was small. Mm. Not through m- me, but I was a mix. My mother suffered that. Yeah. So I, I, at first, I have to tell you the truth. I refused to speak Italian. I kind of like went by my mother's side to some extent, mm-hmm. and it was a contradictory schizophrenic feeling because I love my father very much, and I had incredible admiration for the guy. So I switched back and forth, and maybe that's resilient. That you know, that's mm-hmm. part of my. Yeah. But anyway, see that, that that's uh, those are the the things that I learned. Uh, funny enough, I know other language. The 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 dialect of my father was Furlan. The, from uh, you know the Furlan the the, the yes, dance yes. comes from that place. Oh, and Furlan, uh, you know that you see the in the Swedes, uh, uh, you know, right? Uh, in even medieval dance. I mean, right. Uh, so uh, that's a, which is a beautiful language, and I I I don't speak it fluently. But when I go there, you know, my family speaks it. Still, you know, it's uh, much more than Italian. Uh, I I really I there are many words. It's funny that I learn at such a small age that when I hear it, it's like it it goes directly to the object that it's attached to. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I remember things, learning that even before Spanish, but they were, n- they were not Italian words. They were Furlan words, yeah, wow. which is a different route. Huh? It's a, it goes, uh, Furlan, both Furlan and Sardo, mm-hmm. the language from Sardinia, right. both c- uh, come directly from Latin. They are not dialects of any Dante language, oh. but all of the rest of the dialects in Italy, they are all coming from the original Toscana, mm-hmm. which w- became Italian. Right. The Tuscany dialect became Italian, but these two regions, the languages, for some reason, their their roots are directly from Latin. So it's a uh, not a easy one. That's very interesting. I've always been curious about all the different languages in, in Italy. And, mm-hmm. um, um, you mentioned that your your father really loved music. Can you tell me more about um, your your father and, and music and his inf- maybe his musical influence on you? And um, look, aside from the, f- I say if, if I, again, it's ca- it might sound contradictory to you or to anyone. I, um, my fa- my father loved music, as a listener. Mm-hmm. He had incredible memories about my 
grandfather playing the piano all these Verdi operas and the craziness of my grandfather and my, my, my father used to tell me things uh, strange stories from about my grandfather my grandfather would take a bike and would do 400 kilometers about 220 miles just to go and see one opera in Milano he would travel for two days you know stopping anywhere just to go so my, my father inherited that kind of like a special taste for as a listener mm -hmm. but it was a, a, a low class worker at the same time so th th his experiences with music were very limited mm -hmm. and um, one day I remember I was very small I, I started studying piano when I was a small and I was able to play pretty well when I was old, 10, 11 which was a kind of weird thing in that low income uh, neighbor neighborhood was there a piano in the house oh no that's another story uh -huh. I, I i did get a piano only when i was 11 uh -huh. or 12 11 because uh, we didn't have money yeah so i had to study in, s in different places one place half a block from my father and one place half a block from two blocks from my grandmother the chilean one mm -hmm. so i never had a piano i had to study things kind of like going to different places M my my grandmother finally bought me one when she bought that one I was already playing like a good fifth year student so I was able to play one of the Chopin etudes and the beginning uh, the number three is Da, 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 da. See, that's what a beautiful but and he came running to my room asking me how come that I knew this piece and I said well it's a Chopin etude no it's not a Chopin etude it's tristeze what do you mean tristeze sadness uh -huh. he said well this is the song that the Italians used to sing at the end of the world war Two. I said, this is not a song, I don't, there's no text. Well, whatever, I can sing you the text and you will see that we have a text. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, th those experiences, I remember Santa Lucia, Santa Lucia uh, was a kind of like song dance from the north of Italy that he asked me specifically to play uh, when I was uh, small. He got me the music. My mother, on the other hand, uh, wanted me to play tango. And I learned it a couple of tangos when I was small because she wanted me to play them. But if either or, I didn't identify with either or. I mean, it was kind of a weird thing, you know, this place that I had never visited yet. Mm -hmm. My father came from, and my mom, who even being born in a completely different place that I didn't know until I was eleven or twelve. I think the first time that we went to Chile, he asked me to. She asked me to play this. Uh, Music that actually, when I was a small, I didn't like at all, you know. So you didn't hear much tango as a child, then. Yeah, I heard a lot, but I didn't like it. Yeah. I mean, in any <coughs> household, you would hear a lot of tango, old mm -hmm. tango from the twenties, thirties, because mm -hmm. Piazzolla, for instance, by then was a horrible figure for the establishment. Was okay. someone who didn't, you know, who didn't abide to the rules of tango. Four, four, basta, you know. Four, four always quarters, and you s you dance to it. That's it. Right. So this guy, I can tell you stories about how people would hate oh. him. I've so Piazzolla until 11, 12. Then I then finally I, later on I, I had my experience with with his music and himself. But um, yeah, I, I I as I said, I grew up with that. But the the two or three important things that I have always in my ear were music that I would hear in a small radio because we didn't have any money for any LP player mm -hmm. until I was already professional did you go to concerts as a child or some age? yeah I, I was in this conservatory you know since very early age since I was seven so I, s I would see concert and concert pianists and mm -hmm. concert whatever in this little reduced world of my childhood because in the morning I would go to the school, in the afternoon to the other 
to the conservatory. So it was kind of like my home. Mm-hmm. But the only real experience I would have is that I, I like getting new music constantly, you know? I would go to the library, I would take a piece and try to play it. Uh, but the real experience as a listener, I I was a weirdo. I wanted uh, over the weekends, the weekends w- when the concert happened, I wanted to play soccer, and I went to play soccer like the whole day. You know, Saturday and Sunday. I, you know, I, that the, that's that was the only fitting. Mm-hmm. In the evenings, when I would come from playing soccer the whole day, I would turn the radio, and I was always looking for contemporary music. And and then one of the phenomenal things was my my father bought me this one of the first radios with a cassette recorder yes and I would start recording pieces that I would hear you know about 11 12 years old I was uh, you know already listening to Schoenberg Bartok and Boulez uh, available forms Earl Brown Earl Brown yeah and I remember these things because I would Try to get them and, 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 and listen to them many times. Um, atmospheres, Ligeti. Yeah. I mean, those pieces that work, you know, completely. I mean, the music after, kind of, after Bartok, all this music that I was listening to. So you discovered that all on your own with your own initiative? and Or was there somebody who kind of introduced it to you? No, no, it was yeah, a little bit yeah. by chance. I was I started composing when I was very small, and and mm-hmm. then I, then I, I the 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 truth is also that by age eleven my I was a very avid reader. So I started getting information about all these kind of things, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I read names, and all of a sudden I saw books in the library. Regrettably, our library was su- such a small thing that I finished reading all books that they had like by age 17 or something so I was taking every week something new so which radio station was playing this contemporary music yeah. the national radio in Argentina mm. which was the classical music one um, as I said f- for whatever reason I refused to somehow I refused to go with the known Bach Chopin thing I mean I played them yeah and since I played all the traditional stuff, my ear was hungry for other sonorities, other sounds, mm-hmm. other things, other ways. Uh, and then I started composing, so perhaps it's parallel, you know. Uh, and th- then I was looking in the radio for every single g- program that would give me some other stuff, not necessarily the Bach. You know, or not necessarily Beethoven, because you say, well, I'm studying Beethoven. It's nice, it's great, especially the last pieces. But I wanna, h- and then, and then, then also, for whatever reason, they would provide with a lot of symphonic stuff, and then I started loving the sound. Right. Uh, and then, yeah, already by twelve, thirteen, I thought, you know, I wanna be a conductor. Now at the, the the conservatory you were studying with was that in in Barisal? No, no, in La Plata. Okay. Barisal was such a small town that yeah. didn't have any pianists. Right. Like, there was one pianist in that city or two. Uh huh. I knew the the lady. So there wasn't much music going on there. I mean, no. Was there like a a, a theater that did anything? No, mu- music, yeah. uh, pop, popular music then, kind of an Argentinian rock. Uh huh. I used to hear. I used to hear a lot of American uh, country music, uh-huh. the, you know, the kind of like a invasion, cultural invasion that right. you can perceive, rock, you know. As for classical, no, none, mm-hmm. almost none. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew classical music only through the books in the library, my peers playing, myself reading music. That's it. And then the radio, because I didn't have... Mo- well, the truth is, I didn't have money to go to concerts. Right. On the other hand, you know, if I... I remember... It's such a weird thing that I remember. The first time I heard a live an orchestra, I was 15. Wow. And I remember the piece, even. So even at the, the, the conservatory there, you didn't hear much? You didn't, was there an orchestra? There was no orchestra there. Oh my! 
the orchestra was rehearsing sometimes. I mean, there were so few violinists, so few uh, violas that I remember vividly that I was in the first stand of the violas when I was uh, 17 after uh, practicing the instrument for three months. Okay, I mean, honestly, I played yeah. a lot of piano by then. And I, w I had a, a very interesting, perhaps, brain for a child devoting to music. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make any sense that you already are in three months. And I was uh, able to play well, but see, that shows that we have, I think, three violas total. Mm -hmm. Fifteen violins total. Wow. Playing, you know, first position, third position. That's where the level was. Mm -hmm. And piano was different, but so the orchestra didn't exist. Musical activities were too pricey for a low, low income yeah. family. I had to go to that conservatory and the school every day by bus, and it was 10 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So I, I would have to wake up at 5 to go to the school. And by other, ch other children would go, you know, like 10 minutes before 8. So it wasn't easy. Were your first piano lessons at the conservatory there? No. No. Where did you, where, so who was your first piano teacher? <laughs> the first piano teacher was a teenager that uh, now he must be 60, who had a piano at the corner. Oh, God. I'm remembering that now. My the first piano I played was in the house of the corner where I would take the bus to go back to my mom's place in my grandmother's neighborhood, which was at the last part of Berizzo in the poorest part of Berizzo. So this guy, this guy's father had a kiosk, uh, you know, uh -huh. selling yeah. sweets and cigarettes and things. and magazines and I heard the piano going to this yes uh, th that was the first one but I heard about the piano as an instrument and the organ and the violin because my mother never studied any music but she loved the violin uh -huh. and actually started in the conservatory as a pianist and violinist I see the fact that I, s I don't put in my resume anymore but I started with piano and violin Mm -hmm. Because for some magical reason, when I went to the conservatory, it kind of, my mom pushed me to do it, sort of. My grandmother too, my father too, and I went there and they took us a test. And according to the test, they would assign us instruments, not what we chose. Oh, yes. And for some weird reason, there were 300 kids then and I got the highest test we don't know in music I don't know how they valued my I didn't have any knowledge I didn't have anything I don't know how was the test to me today is incomprehensible therefore when they said that I was the highest in all this group of kids they assigned me to the most difficult <laughs> instrument oh, for them yeah. which was the violin mm -hmm. And my mom was very happy, but I wasn't. I didn't want to practice the violin. I wanted the piano. But she wa she said, well, you got the best. I don't care. I want to play the piano. So <coughs> finally, I I did the two instruments in the first year. So what age did you start playing the violin then? Seven. Uh -huh. So you'd been playing piano for a couple of years then? No. Before yeah, I, exactly. Before yeah. that, I was, yeah, playing in that place with mm -hmm. that kid. But uh, look, nothing important. I started from zero again. Eh? At the conservatory, there's some are there some memorable teachers that you had that that. Yeah. Can you tell me about some of those people? And yeah. Uh, first, uh, the piano school uh, in that country is a still a good one. I mean, you have to remember, Barenboim started there, Argerich started there. Uh huh. Uh, they were bor born Argentinians, and uh, Marta Argerich studied actually with one of the best teachers we know. And my one of my main piano teachers was, is, she is, she's alive, still one of the best f 
friends from Martha. The this lady, Cucucha Castro, she studied in Paris with Argerich when okay. they were both teenagers, wow. and they went to study with uh, Nikita. Uh, what was the name? What's her name? I don't remember. Anyway, a couple of people there. So they they are. Uh, there was uh, this lady Scalcione, Italian, phenomenal piano teacher, and then this other lady that was uh, the first. Uh, uh, this good friend of Marta Argerich. Besides that, my composition teacher, who is uh, still alive, he was the pianist for Piazzolla in the uh, last years. What's his name? Gandini. Uh -huh. uh, Gandini is uh, nowadays is supposed to be the most um, uh, known Argentinian composer. Mm -hmm. When he taught me, he was 36 only, and I was 14. Or yeah, I started. They gave me a special permission to start to start composition two years before I was supposed to. Because I didn't have any, su uh, some subjects that they are required, mm -hmm. but they gave me this permission because of my interest and because the guy accepted me. Had you started composing before you took lessons, some uh, composition lessons? Oh yeah. yeah, I was 11. My first piece was written up by when I was 11. Mm -hmm. And I started writing with him when I was 14. Those uh, people. There was another Frogioni. Frogioni was a, a phenomenal clarinet player from Italy who was the principal clarinet in the National Symphony for some weird reason. In that small city, we got this teacher in chamber music. And uh, I had my first chamber music with this guy. I was 15, playing already Brahms. Wow. Yeah, the, the viola and piano and piano, all these big pieces, you know, when I was uh, small. Most of this Mozart and Beethoven sonatas for violin, I accompanied every violinist in town, all the Brahms, you know, Frank, you name it, I did Debussy, Ravel, whatever, you know. By age 17, I had most of the violin repertoire and viola wow. in the piano. Did you do any of the piano quartet and quintet literature as well? No, I did only the Brahms. So fa so la fa da da. Oh, the F minor. F minor. Yeah, yeah. But not much of the repertoire for quintet or quartet. Uh -huh. I did a lot of duo, some trios. Uh -huh. And the reason is again, it's funny, but it's the truth. The, the reason is that there were no quartets. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, there were no viola player, very few cello players. So the. Uh, Violins were abundant. I mean, mm -hmm. anyone, and and uh, they prefer me for some reason because since very early age I wanted to sight read music, so I was known in the conservatory in the whole town. Every time that they n needed someone who could read any new composition mm -hmm. or any piece that no one knows or anything that it has to be done tomorrow and we have no time to practice, they would call me. Since age. 13. Was there much um, emphasis in the conservatory on um, contemporary music? N no, honestly not, but I had, th there were two figures, two very important figures. One is this guy Gandini, who was very young then, he was only 35, a young What's his first name? Gerardo. Uh -huh. And the other guy was actually one of my first teachers in composition. It was, his name is Gerardi. Mm -hmm. um, this guy was a strong admirer of uh, Pierre Boulez, the, the Boulez from the 50s. Mm -hmm. We are talking about 72, 73, eh? Ni 1973, 72, 74. Uh, he was the guy that taught me how to analyze a 12-tone piece when I was 11, for instance a great deal of information. Um, perhaps it's kind of like too a schematic way of analyzing, okay? Mm -hmm. Perhaps um, sometimes a little bit a naive, naive 
not very well prepared. But hey, I mean, in that south of the world where nothing was done, w where I had to confess to you that my one of my first loves, Anton Webern's uh, Opus 5, Opus 6, Opus 10, and Opus 1, the Pasacalia, I found in the library the, o the only pieces that they had from Webern, and I, I went straight to a copy machine and I made copies and then I was such in such love with this piece that I took the photocopies and I took them to a professional binder so I created my book. It's uh, still there in my shelf in Berizzo and you see this thing and it looks like a beautiful book oh, that's with cool. a cover, the <laughs> you know, leather. Yes. You know, and says Vebran with golden letters. But the words, you know, um, in this poor environment, that someone had the skills to teach and to mm. give me that. I mean, I, I'm thankful. I mean, absolutely. This guy, for instance, was talking about uh, Ives. I mean, no one knew. Oh, so that's your introduction to Ives. I was going to ask. Yeah, no, yeah. no, Ives, Bartok, Ruggles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, m I I remember, m as I told you the other day, I remember listening for the first time in the radio men and mountains and i went bananas believe me i could i i wasn't able to think for hours so the next thing is i wanted to get somehow some um, recording i didn't have any money we didn't have a, a pl lp nothing yeah. uh then i started reading i went and i saw joseph macleis mm -hmm. I was 14 and I saw this book. It was translated into Spanish. It was called in the Spanish Introduction to Contemporary Music. I ate that book in two days. It were like 400 pages. I, w I didn't sleep, you know. So I learned all these details and I started getting information. I remember the third or the fourth LP I bought was the Ives, the Ives Fourth. The first one I bought, I remember, I still remember, was Schoenberg Webern, the second one, Bartok. The third one was Beethoven uh, Eroica. And the fourth one was uh, Ives. Who was the conductor on the Ives? A guy that I met in New York, um, the Uruguayan guy, the, um, the assistant to Stokowski. I met him in New York yeah. three uh, years ago when I was conducting. Cerebiero, Cerebiero. Yeah. I met him, I finally met him by chance when I was, um, I conducted in Carnegie Hall, I think. Yes, yes, when I conducted in Carnegie Hall, he went to the party afterwards. Wow. And I met the guy. Very strange, very nice uh, situation, no? Mm -hmm. Did you also study voice in the conservatory? Uh, no, no, I, I sang a lot. Uh -huh. I sang for four I sang longer in the choir, conservatory choir than my career there. I loved singing. By by the time that I was seventeen, I, I we we had uh, the program was fantastic. I have to say. We have five harmonies. Three traditional harmonies. The last two where you deal, you start in the first one analyzing twelve tone rows. The first one. Mm -hmm. In in terms of piano, you had. 11 years of piano, six years of chamber music, and one year only devoted to singer's repertoire. Mm. So you would learn with someone, a very good accompanist, how to accompany the voice, right. all these areas. So there were many things that we had to learn when we were very young. So I, when I came here to, to Yale, I was enormously prepared mm -hmm. by for, for tasks as I saw my my peers w were not able because I did my career in that conservatory very young I was the youngest ever in the history who started you know but the the amount of things that they throw at you you know so what's the name of that conservatory I forgot to ask uh, Gilardo Gilardi and it was founded by Ginastera my. that was the first conservatory that Gina Stera founded in Argentina. 
By chance also, by chance, because I never met the guy. The mm -hmm. truth is, I did some of his music when I was small, but so uh, there, were, there was a weird combination. There were some extremely dedicated and, and smart teachers. Some of them were just fantastic. Then the environment, not many pianists who could sight read, mm -hmm. not many people interested in contemporary music, but some few guys as a source of information. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of uh, things that were completely was a, like a desert. Still is mm -hmm. to some extent. So everything was there for you because no one did it. Right. Now there's the um, the the um, theater there in La Plata. Mm. Um, um, was there much opera going on there? Is that? Yeah, I r I I sing. And now. Uh, I sang in Magic Flute when I was 11 in that little choir. I thought that's, that's my first experience that theater before it burned. Oh, so the theater burned. Burned in 1977 mm -hmm. when I was uh, already in my adolescent years. The funny thing is that I myself accompanied some of the violinists that entered in the orchestra then and they are now my part of my orchestra, oh they're my, my workers. Goodness. Wow. So some of them know me from, I mean, my first client now was the guy who accompanied with the Brahms client Sonata. My. The first bassoon is the guy that I first conducted as a soloist because he played Mozart yeah. and our conductor wanted to play violin, he was a very good violinist, and he said, Dante, you should conduct, because I think that I will be stronger, because I was the concert master of the orchestra. So he wanted to give me the opportunity. So that, the first bassoon of this theater orchestra now is the guy that actually played his first concerto with me. My. There were many, many situations that are kind of coming back after 20 years. So was that your introduction to, to opera, or? Uh, Pretty much. No, uh, pretty much. Then, then I, I was assistant to the choir master. I became the conductor of the choir when I was 23 in that theater. Mm -hmm. I did a lot. I played as a solist with the orchestra. I accompanied singers. I did the lights. I, I did the... F I, I helped with the costumes. I helped, you know, sending people to the stage. Wow. I did everything possible in the theater. Um... I have here that you're, uh, I hope I can pronounce this name correctly, your first conductor, conducting teacher, Mariano Drago Silanek? Sijanek. Sijanek. Yeah. And he was at the at the conservatory there, right? No. No? Where was that, was that later then? Or was, where, was, where was he? I just, no, look, I just studied with him in privately, because, to make the story short, when I was in the conservatory, I discovered this Scherchen book on conducting. Mm -hmm. And maybe because of uh, my age or something, I was very impressed by that. And I took that as a Bible. So I decided to study conducting only after I play at least fi five or six instruments. Therefore, I started conducting in a very old age. Mm -hmm. I studied with this eye when I was already 20. 23 or 24. By then, I pl I had played piano, harpsichord, violin, viola, oboe, and percussion. So that's when I started. But I didn't start in, in the in the orchestra in the conservatory. Mm -hmm. There was no conducting teacher. And I found th this guy, this very guy, was the conductor of the orchestra where. I am now conducting right. for four years. And this guy was the, the only teacher that Carlos Kleiber had in his life. My. <coughs> very, very strange story of this. This, this, this guy was um, a Jewish Czech emigre mm -hmm. who studied at the Prague Conservatory, who at age 20 something, 22, 23, 
completed his last examination as a conductor by, I remember that because he told me, playing and conducting the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto and in the second part, Beethoven Third. So this guy, is, uh, after the war, you know, was such a disaster in Europe, he started emigrating everywhere. He, went, he wanted to get a job anywhere, so he went to France. So he, he got this job, I say, in a, in a touring company, ballet company. So he went down to Argentina. So he conducted the orchestra in that theater because mm. he was part of the company. The company fu fought. I mean, they had many problems. They split. So this guy was all of a sudden without a job in that country. He would sleep under the trees outside of the in the gardens outside of the theater right. for a couple of days until one guy saw him and said, You were conducting three nights ago. Yeah, you were fantastic. You know? Well thank you. But why are you I have no house, no place. I cannot go back to Europe. I invite you to live in my place. This guy's name was Drago. That's why my teacher took his name as a tribute. Oh my. But Sijanek was his actual name, Sijanek. Mm -hmm. uh, then after a couple of days he went back to the he went back to the theater and said, Look, you know me, yeah, you were gonna okay, I need a job. And since uh, everyone thought that the, the guy was phenomenal, he, the, the director then gave him a job for a year. He stayed in the same orchestra for 35 years or 40. He never left Argentina and he never left that orchestra. So he built this um, conducting uh, teaching mm -hmm. in, that, in, in, that, in that city. Mm -hmm. But by the time that I wanted to study conducting, he was already very old and he didn't teach anymore in the university because he was doing parallel teaching the university and conducting the theater. And I went to see him and uh, he accepted me. He took me a, a test or something and he taught me for a couple of years. What are some of the things that, um, that you learned from him that stay with you today? Some important things. Oh, from the musical point of view, uh, strictly kind of like, say, phrasing. Uh, he was someone who was completely, com he was much more com convinced of, of on the Furt Wengler uh -huh. kind of idea. Not the improvisation in the moment, but at least the flexibility to uh, acknowledge a, a piece uh, as a new one even though it was written 300 years ago, right. every time that you try it. Um, so it wasn't kind of like a schematic mm -hmm. guy. He had an incredible elegance in the poem. I never learned that, actually. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> I don't think I... Uh, one thing that stuck with me for many years was uh, he was always looking for kind of like a weird or... F we are relationship, uh, factual relationship between gestures and sounds. Uh -huh. Wh whereas, after many years, I've recognized that, you know, I mean, you elaborate a technique, and you, I, I, I'm, I'm very completely opinionated in many things that I, uh, we conductors do. So there are certain rebounds and uh, places in the space that you have to use your gestures in order to produce whatever, you know, togetherness or dark sound or light sound or something. I mean, it's a very complicated subject that I'm I'm writing about, honestly, now for the last two or three years. I won't, but it's a very complicated book, too. I mean, it's not something easy to read. I mean, there are many details. And I remember that so something that he installed in my brain. Uh, and now, I mean, after many years, I, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think that it's, not that it's not, I mean, it's not, you cannot define that a given gesture will produce a given sound. Obviously not. I mean, anyone can see that. But at the same time, the other side of the idea is to be able 
to create a gesture gestural message so you can be predictable they you can help them and they can see a clarity a very clearly defined picture so no one has a doubt about ensemble or, or togetherness so it remained with me for many years and I think that influenced my conducting in that aspect a, a, a clarity, a clarity of purpose a clarity of conveying a, 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 a a straightforward, clear message mm -hmm. to people. Uh, then some ideas about uh, interesting ideas because he always referred gestures to the Greek Roman art sculptures. Interesting. And it was w was nice. I mean, look, uh, I said in a way you have to acknowledge that uh, metaphorically we are speakers to a crowd. So, if you analyze the biggest, the most important monuments of our culture, then the gene genetic code comes from them. Mm -hmm. So, European culture is based on the Greek and Roman world. Right. So, the syllogism was, for instance, look at any statue where you see an emperor or an important figure talking to the crowd. If you analyze the posture and the arms, you will never see a parallel. Mm -hmm. You will never see a parallel, you know, a, a, a parallel two two arms. You will never see the arms down, not conveying any meaning. You will never see the. Yeah. What you will see is a gesture. That someone who wants to convey an important message generally speaking does across the cultures that we all copy that in the, the whole European continent and again it went to America right. is some sort of motion that implies that even though it's never a mirror be between the two hands is some way to approach in a clearly defined curve and a very elegant one, he would say, you know, in such a way that you see that the message almost goes through them to the crowd. So if you uh, understand that, you will see that there's no justification whatsoever to do a replica of um, a given gesture to beat the time with the other the other hand, unless you want to overemphasize a given message of um, of the difficulty of the, t uh, the, the pursuing the togetherness, mm -hmm. somehow there are uh, codes that are understood with with a, that you know. If you study information theory, it's more or less a variation of what we do, or we do a variation of information theory. Right. Um, uh, therefore, those little things sometimes the, the you know the how do we come from the beauty of the greek and romans certainty clarity of objectives you know um but we didn't study much repertoire to be completely honest i was just gonna ask uh -huh. no much i mean we emphasize you know i remember beethoven first for weeks and i remember brahms first for weeks and remember oberon it was difficult because he was uh, along with his wife in this town in a very rich part of Buenos Aires. I had to travel three and a half hours to get to his place. Wow. So how often did you... Once a week on Mondays, the only free day in a theater. Mm -hmm. He never charged me a single dime. My. I never understood why. And he said to me, I remember that I had such a big talent for him that he will never charge me. So I would sometimes bring some little present. The truth is, at that point, I was still, even though I was professional already, 
I didn't have much money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it took me a lot of sacrifice to get there, and I didn't have money for a score. So I was telling my son yesterday that he has to remember that my father went with two baggages from Italy to Argentina, and I came to this country with two, and two scores. Mm. You know, I, I had about 500 scores now, but I had two when I first came here, because I didn't have the money. Yeah. Beethoven and, and Bach. Brandenburg, and it was the Dover. Uh -huh. When the Dover started, it was yeah. my salvation. Because Dover for me was the only way I could get scores. Right. Otherwise, I didn't have the money. It was a sacrifice every time that I had to buy piano pieces. Mm -hmm. We'd record the Argentina, which was a bad publisher, you know, my, 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 my Chopin Etudes, for instance, you know, or Beethoven Sonatas, recorded with terrible fingering, you know, bad slurs. But I didn't have any other thing. I mean, I couldn't, you have no idea. When I went to Brazil, the first time in my life I was 21. By then, I already, the only thing that I was looking for is contemporary music, anywhere, you know, under, under a table, anywhere, that, where I, you know. Then I went to Sao Paulo by bus, to 1,000 miles. And when I heard that there was this big library, municipal library, I went there running from the bus station. And I found Hindemith's solo sonata, violin solo. I was already studying violin again. Or Berg, the Opus 4. You know, and then I saw a couple of pieces by Stockhouse, and I went bananas. For me, it was something that for you guys would have been easy. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same in different continents. You know, sometimes there are things that are not as automatic as you might think. I mean, I I remember making copies of Alban Berg Opus One when I was thirteen was one score I could find in the library. The only thing they could do is take it, go to the copy shop and make copies and because one score was half part of my father's salary. Yeah. My father, I told you was a carpenter, but the, he quit he quit that when I was born. He was a truck driver because mm -hmm. he didn't give money being a carpenter. So my father would take me in his truck and we would talk about everything. So being a truck driver, getting you Alban Opus one? No, 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 forget it. I mean, no. Getting a Stockhausen, Universal Edition. I, I saw the first Universal Edition when I went to the library and I saw the Alba, Alban Berg, but it was the first and last one. Then after two years, I saw Weber. So they were so pricey that no one could buy them. No one, not even a library. So that, that, that was actually the situation. Wow. Now, when you went to Sao Paulo, how long were you there? Uh, were, did you, were you studying there or what brought no. you there? You just went? Vacation. Yeah. I was, I was, I don't remember, I was 19 or 21. 19. 19. No, it was vacation, but I and uh, we, I went with a, a group of friends. <coughs> we didn't know where we were going. I mean, uh -huh. finally we ended up, I don't know, I think in Rio or something. Yeah. And we ended up there by chance, and I, as I said to you, you know, they were crazy because they were just wanting to go to the beach, and I went to the library <laughs> to great. see them. <laughs> the stupid scores. I mean, I couldn't believe when I saw some scores. Ah, the first time that I saw, I made copies of... Berios was a piece for piano. Variations, variazioni. Uh -huh. I made a copy there. I mean, imagine that. After so many years, I still remember the first time that I saw some pieces, and I still remember me going like crazy because I was able to make copies. Yeah. I mean, this is when I be terrible for the copyright. But that's the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is, you didn't do it, you could uh, starve. That's right. Yeah. Musically speaking. Because there was no other way. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway. And you studied uh, oboe and percussion. Was that at the um, the, the, the conservatory? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oboe was there. Percussion was in, I studied in the States. Uh -huh. Oboe I did uh, with the principal of the orchestra that I'm conducting now, yeah. who retired, of, obviously, he retired. And he's the father of the second flute. <laughs> but anyway, right. it's funny. The percussion, no, percussion I did in the, um, as a secondary instrument in, at Yale. Uh -huh with a couple of very nice peers they taught me mm -hmm. great great you know percussion players so when you were um and it sounds like when you were a teenager you already had the idea that you might want to be a conductor so you were learning some of these other instruments to to give you some background with that right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. absolutely so where did you do your undergraduate education um, I finished high school when I was 16, one or two years earlier, because I started very young. By then, you would have to choose a career, because in Argentina, it, it, it before the, the mold of France and Italy, they were the two models in Argentina. Mm -hmm. So the, so actually, you choose to be an architect when you are 18. It has its very bad things. It has some nice things. Among other things, when, when you come with certain amount of education to this country, generally speaking, when you go and you confront yourself with the masters, you see that other people who devoted the liberal they are four years in liberal arts. Mm -hmm. They have a very well grounded, beautiful general education, much more than you. Maybe, maybe, you never know. But in the concrete knowledge of a given career, mm -hmm. by definition, they can't. <coughs> I, I, there I, I had to confront the first difficulty in my life because uh, I had a conflict when I was 15 in the conservatory. I almost quit. Oh, you have no, to? No, no. Uh, I almost quit uh, music for some problem that I had in when I was 15. Uh, so I wasn't completely sure about keeping with music. My father did want me to st keep playing but he was very contradictory two years after when I had to choose career because no one would ever think that I could be a musician as a career. Mm -hmm. A truck driver, housewife, they would love music, but hey, get real. That combined with my demonstrated, as at least is what my, my teacher said, talent for mathematics made me think that the only way is to do math and maybe do parallel. Finish the conservatory and keep, you know, start with the, the real profession. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point was the dirty, dirty war in Argentina. Oh, yes. So it was a, a difficult time for many reasons. They reinstalled the examination to, st to enter in the university, which is fun, it's mm -hmm. great, it's okay, uh, and it was a difficult test, but I passed, so I was accepted, and I started math in La Plata. My honest wish was to do uh, a doctorate in pure math, pure mathematics. Mm -hmm. Now, was this a college or a university in La Plata? What university. Uh -huh. so What's it called? Uh, uh, University of La Plata. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as you might understand, I didn't, est for instance, in the university, aside from English, there was nothing, nothing of history, geography, or anything. It was all math. So, I, plus, I was one or two years younger than anyone. So, my math skills were very, very 
developed in the following three years until I was 20. But I never left music. And the combination of factors, for some reason, is that the very first year that I started with math, I got my first professional job as a musician. Then I got a second job, then I, do, I did two of them, then I started my third instrument. So little by little, then I started doing a lot of chamber music with everyone. I was playing every day, every evening. What I was supposed to do in two, in one year, I did in two. In, in, you know, I was postponing things. I used my talent for math, but the thing is, to put it bluntly, it, it was getting boring. Mm -hmm. uh, boring to the extent that I knew that I had the skills, but I didn't have the interest. At the same time, music was taking off. You know, my second job, all of a sudden, I, I, I'm, I was chosen. They gave me a, a contract for being the harpsichord and piano player of the best orchestra, chamber orchestra in the country. So then I thought, gee, I mean, besides that, for all my father's arguments, I was earning more money when I was 18 than him when he was my age now. Mm -hmm. Plus, I was uh, invited to teach music in a higher school when I was 17. So the security wasn't fantastic, but I was doing the music as a second job as a second thing, because in the morning I was in the university, right. in the afternoon too. Two days a week I went to the orchestra, and in the evening I was playing piano. When I finished playing piano or viola or anything, I, I, I had to go study math. And again, you know, it was a crazy life. And I didn't quit composing. So all this combination of factors it got me to kind of like a completely stressful 20 years old. And I, when, hel you know, my health went bankrupt. I collapsed when I was 20, November, I remember, 19 or tw ni 20, because I couldn't handle it anymore. I was playing in that orchestra, composing, attending the university, studying viola, and writing texts, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and my collapse ended up being quitting math and composition. So I, I took a path that I, I thought many years after, and, and I'm, I'm trying to solve these things now with therapy, among other things, and with composing, in spite of neglecting, apparently, neglecting my father's mandatory, willful wish, we would, his, his idea of getting something for real, I became a musician, but in the most rational way. Mm -hmm. I developed my piano skills. I developed my ears. I developed my viola, violin playing. I, I, I took they all and I, and I put as a goal, I will be a conductor. Mm -hmm. I will be what I wanted to be when I was 13. But I cut my legs and my arms and my fingers for creating anything. I, I, I refused to, I, I didn't acknowledge anymore my creative part of my personality, I never again tried to compose and I because I was going crazy. Because in the m middle of that nightmarish times in which I had to do one zillion things at the same time, when I composed, I would spend hours and hours by myself locked in my room and I thought that I was going crazy. Plus Henry Miller, mm -hmm. plus Bertrand Russell. So is yes. plus plus the then unknown Garcia Marquez mm -hmm. plus Dante 
you know, plus all the piles of cassettes of contemporary music, my complete, completely crazy, I don't know where to go <coughs> technique, you know, because I got to kind of like a Bergian or Boulez sort of, but then I didn't know what, I didn't, I didn't know how to follow. Schoenberg killed me. Mm -hmm. It's not that Schoenberg was dead. Killed me. Mm -hmm. Or, and uh, uh, after my dodecaphonic viola piano sonata, and the, uh, I, I also did a con triple concerto for it's all dodecaphonic for violin, cello, and piano, an orchestra. Right. Then I didn't know what to do. I was, I thought I was going crazy. I thought that I, uh, but literally losing the res the reasoning capacity. Mm -hmm. I couldn't handle anything. In spite of being successful in the music world in that small town, I didn't know how would I make it as a musician, and I couldn't stand math anymore. I never lost the love for math, but not I didn't want and I will never in the next years of my life feel trapped in that kind of you have to study math mm -hmm. I have many books of math and I still read a lot but just as a kind of like li little puzzle mm -hmm. little you know so I think that that decision created everything that you saw until a year ago two years ago, I mean from the 42nd year of my life, right. in the last two, three, four, it's like I'm, I'm kind of like going back to some roots. So the, um, the um, I mean many composers have talked about the oppression of 12-tone technique and serialism. Um, was that something that was just more kind of self-imposed on you because you saw this stuff or was was there anybody who was kind of pushing that on you? I think that the academia did it to all of us, mm -hmm. uh, to some extent, in many countries. Yes. I, I, I think so in Europe was very clear. In South America with the Italian thing also. But see, I, I, think, I think it is a combination. It's a phenomenal propaganda. It's a, it's a phenomenal propaganda that is, you know, it's like going Darwinistic, right. going Darwin, Darwin, is, you know, the evolution theory is something that is related, is evidently related to, you know, this music is dead, this is alive, and this is the path. Right. One, I think, I didn't realize that then, but the only, the biggest, probably the biggest force in the world to counteract that was here. And we didn't realize that. Because in our conservatory thing, at least in Argentina, being a very uh, European country in South America, we follow the path of France, Italy, the avant-garde, you know? Right. There was a Argentine composer theorist, Juan Carlos Paz. Was, was oh, he, yeah. Was pa he in, was Paz. He, was he influential that way? Oh, one? man. Juan Carlos Paz was exactly one of the most influential books I read in my teenager years. He did a wonderful, one. I had a book here, wonderful book, I don't know if it was translated here in, in English. A, a, a quotations, comments on concerts and ideas, but the guy was such a um, very a strong advocate for what he thought the avant-garde was. Mm -hmm. He did acknowledge, for instance, these crazy Ives as a major force. At the same time, everything that was not under the rules of Schoenberg, mm -hmm. Bevern, Boulez, was completely out. Mm -hmm. He did a phenomenal book of, it's called Introduction to the, uh, Our Times Music, in Spanish. Was the other with Maclis. And with the Stravinsky, I mean, I read many books. Uh, you know, my my source was reading books and reading, so I learned names before I heard their music. Mm -hmm. I learned every single detail known in Spanish and Italian of Ives before I heard two pieces. Mm 
Wow. Then I heard the pieces. Had you read the essays before Sonata? Of course. Yeah. I bought it when I was se 17. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. Well, the next interview, we'll get into Ives more. Mm -hmm. um, when did you start playing tango? Um, and how did that come about? Oh, that was crazy. I was 18. I didn't like tango at all. I was getting famous in the little town I was born. There was a weird guy, 300 pounds, 300 something, probably, who used to live near a church I used to go. And I always saw him uh, in his forge. I learned me after years that the guy knew seven languages and he was teaching the math teachers of the university, my teachers. He never earned any degree anywhere, anywhere. And he was hired to teach chemistry in one university, math in another. I mean, it was like kind of a genius. Everyone talk about him in the in town. He sent an emissary to me. He sent someone to talk to me because he knew that I was playing viola. But he knew that I my main instrument was piano and I was a composer. And then he learned that I was studying math. So all his loves. I went to this rehearsal, and by then I had played the viola for one year. But as I told you, I learned things so quickly that by my second year I was able to play fourth, fifth position, you know, mm. things that people normally do in many years. But I was already old, old, 17, 18, you know. So what was this man's name? Uh, Iriarte. Iriarte. I R I. A R T E. The fat Idiarte was said in, 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 uh -huh. in. Yeah, El Gordo. So, what were his instruments? Piano, uh -huh. men. He played. He knew. You name it, by the 70s, he knew all the contemporary music written in Europe and the States. We would talk about these subjects when I was a teenager. And this guy, playing piano, doing weird arrangements of Piazzolla, whom he considered the biggest genius in Argentina, and he was the only one, because Piazzolla was, was not loved. I mean, he was hated by most tango players. This only guy said that he, he, he did his arrangements of mm -hmm. Piazzolla and other pieces in the manner of Piazzolla, and he always said the only real musician of all this tango style, remember, is going to be remember Piazzolla. Just remember, 30 years from now, it happened. Uh, he invited me to, to play in his orchestra as a, as a viola player. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a weird ensemble because a kind of modern tango in which he would do arrangements uh, starting with I remember some of the tangos starting with we are church modes bananas yeah. or Stravinsky and rhythms that will cross with Boulez effects and then the tango started I mean completely I didn't do the traditional tango myself I see I started with that weirdo <laughs> and then the guy got sick and he knew that I was a pianist professional already, you know, in big orchestras. So mm -hmm. he asked me from his bed that I should take over his position. So I played some rehearsals and a concert, but I, I never, never, I finally left. Because um, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wanted, as I said, I, I studied all those things all together at 17, 18, math, you know, composition seriously, uh, jobs as a harpsichord player, you know, all the Bach that you can name, you know, all these concerti, 
all the whole ball together was a big thing that uh, bigger than I could handle. Then at age 20, I cut everything. I, I did this, you know, with the, that you do with the branches in the tree. I said, okay, I have to go like this. Yeah. I cut. And uh, tango, I mean, I didn't tell you, I was in a rock band. No. I was in a rock band when I was 17. And you played keyboards? I played keyboards. And my style, they like my style of improvisation because then I always improvise. I cut improvisation when I was 20. I'm starting improvising now two years ago. Again, for 22 years, I never improvised again. Only a couple of times when I went, I learned jazz. And I played as a jazz player for my living in New Haven. So I always had the capacity, but it's always kind of like inside. I never wanted to open that. And I decided two years ago that I will open it for the rest of my life, period, no matter what. But then they heard me improvising, so they asked me to play in this rock band because I, they talk about names that I n never heard in my life. Chick Corea, mm -hmm. Keith Jarrett. I didn't know what they were, who they were, where they play, and what they played. I never heard anything. So then I remember that we were uh, recording from with the rock band some things. I finished, they passed me, you know, they play back the recording and say, okay, listen to this one. It was similar to what Keith Jarrett used to do. Uh -huh. So I said, who is this guy? I mean, I didn't know anything. I was completely ignorant. I don't care about it, this yeah. being published. I was an ignorant. Yeah. In many aspects of musical life, I was a clear son of an immigrant truck driver. Mm -hmm. um, the counterpart is that there were many other things that people learn when they are very old that I learned when I was very small. But this completely unbalanced <coughs> rock, tango, classical music, contemporary music, baroque played every single week, all this Corelli Concerti Grossi, every single piece of Bach, you know, the complete opposite constantly. They, 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 it was like bouncing your head against all this knowledge all together. That served me a lot until now, but also was a kind of energy drain, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But that that's the the truth about my last adolescent years. So did you go on to do a, a bachelor's degree in music um, in Argentina? No. No. What I did it, it was I went to the university where my teacher used to teach. I quit math. I finished the second year of the university, kind of. You have time? No. You could, no I'm oh, we are okay. You yeah. I, I I'm just watching the make sure the machine is still going. Yeah, I have like 10 minutes. Okay. Somehow. Um, I went to the university to study orchestral conducting because there was the, there was the degree. When I quit math, I was 19 or 20, and I took the examination, the test, to go to this university because I wanted to do this degree but when I went to the test I found out that the teachers knew a lot less than me and I was re it was a, one of the first violent things that I really felt in my life I couldn't believe that I, I was I mean I had studied so much about so many styles by then and I knew so many things about practical music making chamber music you know that I couldn't believe that these guys I passed eight examinations that normally people do in two years in a month. But then when I finished and I said, I'm gonna, am I going to stay here with this deaf ignorance? I'm sorry. I was always ignorant. I, I am. <laughs> but I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah. In that place, I met Osvaldo Gorihov. Okay. Now this was the University of La Plata, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I never had from this that school a degree what they did when I came to the States is 
my degree as in the conservatory was a such a high level mm -hmm. what can I explain uh, besides the, 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 the subjects that I told you we studied pedagogy we studied theory of education we studied counterpoint three years I mean like anything in the musical matters that you can think of uh, there was one thing that was called the transition would be analysis four years of analysis of pieces from medieval times to the last one was uh, uh, this guy, the Polish composer uh, Penderecki yeah. so they they made the equivalent of the degree between my studies at the conservatory and my three years at math mm -hmm. And so that's why they usually define my undergraduate degree as math plus piano plus whatever. Because there was no college then there. Mm -hmm. So when I came here to do the test for studying at Yale in the master's degree, before I came, I sent all the paperwork for all the classes that I passed in the university and all the classes that I passed in the conservatory. Mm -hmm. None of them was in the music school at the university. In spite of the fact that I passed eight classes yeah. in one month. But it didn't make sense for us. It didn't make because I mean the the work I mean you should have seen the my exam in harmony. I mean I could by age nineteen I could harmonize what I mean in the latest Strauss style. They were asking me for some Bach chorale that I had done when I was 11. And that was one class. Yeah. I mean, I, I then I thought, you know, this is not serious. Of course, I have to acknowledge that. Osvaldo told me, hey, man, you have been doing music since you first breathed. Yeah. I mean, I studied music when Osvaldo was not playing instruments. I, w I had already been in fifth year playing Chopin in the Right. Uh, Osvaldo had a uh, phenomenal talent for composition anyway. So he stayed there and then he went to Israel. But I quit and I didn't know what, what where to go. Mm -hmm. So I did the second part of Scherchen. I did all these instruments and now I have to become a choral conductor. Another mm -hmm. life, yeah. Uh -huh. And I, by chance, was called because my sister was in a very important chorus, and h her conductor needed a an assistant. So, which chorus was this? The university chorus. Uh -huh. So I became assistant to the university chorus when I was twenty-one, and then I was thinking, yes, everything is a step by step. I'm achieving everything. When I finish doing this, I will start conducting. So that's how the trend went. So is this a place to stop, or do you want to? Do you have some more time? Because may, maybe better to stop. Okay. Be because I I I I have to leave. I have to arrange some things. Okay. But uh, I hope it was interesting. This, this is very good. <laughs> so, um, so next time we'll um, we'll continue with your work at at, uh, at Yale, mm -hmm. um, at, and then your time here at MIT, and then talking about um, contemporary music, you mm. know, Ives, and um, I want to ask you about Evans of Corn and John, John Harbison, mm. and, and then um, a discussion about um, musical performance in higher education. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and kind of what that means and some of the challenges for that. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay? Great. Um, it's good. So there'll be a lot to talk about next time, but we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. Okay. So thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you. That's very nice.